Well, we begin with the Fulton County Grand Jury indicting former President Donald Trump and 18 of his allies in the Georgia 2020 election case. This is his fourth criminal indictment in less than five months. Trump faces 13 criminal counts related to his alleged efforts to overturn the presidential election results in the state. There are 18 co-defendants, including Trump's former lawyer and the New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani and former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis spoke about the sweeping indictment late last night. The indictment alleges that rather than abide, abide by Georgia's legal process for election challenges, the defendants engaged in a criminal racketeering enterprise to overturn Georgia's presidential election result. In a statement, the former president's attorney said, quote, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office clearly decided to force through and rush this 98-page indictment. CBS's Nicole Skanga joins us now from Atlanta. Nicole, great to see you. We know you've been there since uh, late last night into today again. Uh, break it down for the uninitiated in plain English. What exactly is the former president now accused of doing? Ed, Meg, good to be with you, too. And the former president is being accused of serving as a ringleader of sorts of a criminal enterprise designed to overturn the 2020 presidential elections here in the state of Georgia. And before this latest charging document was handed up to the Fulton County Superior Court, the former president had already faced 78 charges in other indictments. But this is the first time that Trump faces racketeering charges. Now, RICO cases, as they are called, were uh, first used in the 1970s against the mob. And if you've been hear us, hearing us refer to them as sprawling, it's because, well, it is sprawling. This indictment, 97 pages, 19 defendants. You mentioned 41 felony counts. It collected 161 separate acts in total. Now, some of those accusations can stand alone in the court of law here in Georgia. Conspiracy to commit election fraud, for instance, forgery, filing false documents, that now notorious call that uh, the president had made to Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. But there are other acts that could not stand alone in a court of law here in Georgia. The president's tweets, for instance, or some of those efforts by Trump operatives to influence election results in other states, Michigan, Arizona, Pennsylvania, namely. But prosecutors using those overt acts to paint a picture, to tell a broader story of election conspiracy that took place here in Fulton County. And Nicole, we're talking about 18 co-defendants. So walk us through what they allegedly did. Yeah, Meg, some prominent advisors of the former president that our viewers will recognize, Rudy Giuliani, the uh, former president's former personal attorney, Mark Meadows, his uh, former chief of staff who uh, sat in that role during the election. There are those who spoke at hearings here in Georgia uh, to convince state lawmakers to overturn those 2020 elections, folks like lawyer Ray Smith. There are three so-called fake electors who are serving as co-defenders those who claim to be official, like former chair of the Georgia GOP, David Schaefer. There are individuals who traveled from out of state to harass and intimidate Fulton County election workers, like Ruby Freeman. There are officials involved in efforts to illegally access election data in nearby Coffee County, a rural district outside of Atlanta. Folks like GOP official Kathleen Latham. Nicole, uh, it was a late night there in Atlanta. You were in the room last night during the press conference with the DA. What did she have to say about the situation with the charging document that some may have heard went around before the indictment was unsealed? It suddenly popped up online. It looked like it did. Then it went away. Her office disputed uh, its authenticity, uh, but it seems to have contributed to the rush to get this done late last night. Ed, no doubt a tense moment during that press conference last night. Uh, the question should be, what didn't the Fulton County DA say? You know, she told reporters, no, I can't tell you anything, adding that she's not an expert in clerk or administrative duties. You know, this after uh, the former president's attorneys blasted the Fulton County DA for what they called a mishap here. Now, the Fulton County DA did say during that press conference that she would give defendants until August 
25th to surrender at the courthouse, mentioning that arrest warrants have been issued, uh, as is typical under Georgia state law. It remains to be seen in the coming days when exactly the former president will appear for his initial arraignment at the courthouse behind me. We know that he is planning to host a press conference in Bedminster, New Jersey uh, next week and will potentially discuss some of the allegations here. We do know there is already a significant U.S. Secret Service footprint on the ground here in Atlanta. They have been doing site evaluations for weeks. Already Atlanta, uh, a big hub for U.S. Secret Service nearby former President Jimmy Carter. Uh, but I am told that that a federal law enforcement presence is expected to grow into next week and perhaps a sign of when we could see the former president pop up here behind me. All right, Nicole Skanga, who covers all things Homeland Security and Justice for us and today is in Atlanta. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And the former president's legal troubles go beyond the indictment in Georgia. Trump's co-defendant in the federal classified documents case has pleaded not guilty to federal charges. Mar-a-Lago property manager Carlos de la Vera appeared before a judge in federal court in Florida today. He faces four charges related to his alleged attempt to delete security footage sought by investigators. De Oliveira's two earlier hearings were postponed because he didn't have a lawyer in the state. Former President Trump and 18 co-defendants face a number of major charges in the latest indictment out of Georgia. The indictment describes the group as a, quote, criminal organization carrying out a scheme to overturn the 2020 election results in the state. All defendants, including the former president, are charged with racketeering. If convicted on those charges, they would likely face prison time. Graham Cates and David Becker join us now. Graham is a CBS News investigative reporter. David is a CBS News election law contributor and executive director of the Center for Election Innovation and Research. It's great to have you both here with us. Graham, I want to start with you. And, and what does it mean exactly to get charged under Georgia's RICO Act? You know, in that kind of popular knowledge, we think of RICO as a charge that's used for mobsters and people in gangs. And in Georgia, there is some of that, but it, it's used more broadly in that state in particular. Uh, it's a charge that basically means you are among multiple people accused of committing multiple connected crimes. And at Fannie Willis, the district attorney, as an assistant DA, actually prosecuted one of the most well-known RICO cases in Georgia that, that had nothing to do with gang crime or anything like that. And that was a uh, case that involved teachers and school administrators in what was essentially a uh, test rigging scandal. And that was a RICO case. And it gives you an example of how differently that law is used in Georgia compared to a lot of other places. David, turning to you, what do you make of this sprawling nature of this indictment? This does appear to be the most ambitious of the four now that he faces. Yeah, it certainly goes very deep, specifically in Georgia. And as was noted, this RICO racketeering charge is the one that unites all 19 defendants. It's the one thing that all of them are charged with as a very serious charge. It comes with it mandatory jail time if it's proven in a court of law and, and these defendants are convicted. And at the center of this criminal enterprise that is alleged in the indictments are really three major elements all going towards the ultimate goal of overturning the will of Georgia's voters. First, the fake electors scheme, lying to uh, electors and legislators, recruiting uh, uh, fake electors and then submitting false slates of electors claiming they were duly certified. Second, all of the false claims about made about the voting machines and the efforts then to literally seize and breach illegally the voting machines in places like Coffee County, Georgia, as Nicole mentioned. Um, and lastly, of course, the kind of um, harassment and threats and lies made to elected officials and election officials throughout the state, most notably Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger on that famous call, but also other legislators in the state, people in the governor's office, and even poll workers like Ruby Freeman, who were threatened from a very early stage after the 2020 election. You, Graham, I, I want to talk a little bit more about Fawny Willis. Um, if not already, she's about to become a household name across this country. What kind of pressure is she under to secure a conviction? You know, I think all of the prosecutors who have charged uh, Trump this year are on, under a lot of pressure. But in her case, she's already heard from uh, Georgia Republicans about, and things that these have actually been echoed by Trump, 
focus on the crime in Atlanta and all these other things, and it makes a big difference. This is a huge case with 19 defendants, allegations that cross the country, and they're well-financed defendants. Uh, tr uh, Trump and his allies have already spent some $40 million on cases this year, and her office is the smallest of the ones that are charging him, so it's going to be kind of a budget crutch. She's dealing with a backlog of cases in her city, and she's dealing with one of the biggest most highly anticipated, most watched, well-funded uh, defense teams that, that she'll ever face and that really any prosecutor will ever face. So there's a lot riding on making sure that this goes over based on the circumstances in her own county. How likely is it that we're going to see all of these co-defendants appear? It's hard to say. I know she said she wants them all uh -huh. uh, to, to be co-defendants and, and appear at the same time, but that's a lot of people and, 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 there are, and they all need to kind of play along and, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of things that have to happen before we get all 19 in the same room at the same time. It's going to be a hell of a courtroom if that ever does happen. You're going to find one big enough to hold them all. Uh, David, Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, somebody I know you know very well, put out a statement saying you either have respect for the Constitution and rule of law or you don't. What does this indictment say broadly about the state of American democracy now about two and a half years since that assault on the Capitol? Yeah, it's remarkable, isn't it? We're sitting here, we're literally over a thousand days since that November 2020 election. Over that time, there has still not been a shred of evidence shown to any court anywhere in the country, including in Georgia, or to law enforcement demonstrating there was any problem with that election. And yet the lies remain. And in fact, so many, so many of the people who are spreading the lies about our election process have so far not seen consequences from those lies, despite all of the um, harm that has been done. And this harm is not just to kind of the abstract thought of democracy. It's also been done to individuals, election officials out there who have been threatened and abused repeatedly, continuing now to this day. I've seen it all over the country, not just in Georgia, poll workers like Ruby Freeman, who've suffered greatly uh, by the lies that have been spread about them. So uh, that's where we are with our democracy. But this is an important step. Because if we are going to regain trust in our democracy and we're going to all agree on the reality of, of the security of our elections, we're going to need to hold those who have spread lies accountable. And if these charges are proven, this is a really good step in that direction. Yeah. Well, great conversation. Good thing you two will continue to track this for us. Graham Cates here in New York, David Becker in D.C. Thank you.